Okay, fantastic. Okay, good day, everybody. Um, hope everybody's doing well today. Let's start off by um, talking a little bit about Lean Six Sigma Operational Excellence. Uh, we're going to cover Lean, and then we're going to go into Six Sigma. And this is all basics. Um, but one thing I want to bring up first of all is uh, you know, Lean Six Sigma is not a a cookie cutter, um, you know, out of the box uh, uh, program. Um, even though Toyota has been doing this for 60 plus years, and uh, many other companies have been doing it for uh, several years too, um, everybody has their own twist. It's the same tools, but they may use them a little bit differently. Okay? Um, so what is Lean Six Sigma? Well, on the Six Sigma side, um, it's what are our customers' expectations? How do we deliver and meet those customers' expectations? And then it's a mindset. And the big thing on this mindset is, is that it changes your culture and your philosophy of, about the company. Now, I'm sure everybody understands that cultures don't change overnight. Um, you know, I go into places and they say, Tom, it, it, the, the culture hasn't changed and it's been three weeks. Well, no, it hasn't. And, you know, in a lot of cases, um, when I go into places, uh, what I find is, is that um, it's easy for management to blame the workforce. Um, I hear things like, Tom, the, the, the workforce just doesn't, it's different here. Um, we have a union workforce. We have this. Um, one thing I found is that it's usually not the workforce. And for those that are union, um, I've never had a problem with the union, and I've worked in some pretty tough plants. Um, it, usually it's management, and it's their perception. You know, we're... We're all here to support the company. The company makes our, it gives us our paycheck. We're all there to support the company. Um, and the other part is, is that we all need a coach. You know, just because there's training that goes on doesn't mean that, uh, okay, I've been trained. Now I go back and I know exactly what to use um, in, in certain uh, situations. Um, everybody needs a coach. Uh, winning teams and business is no different than than your than a great sports team. Uh, you need good coaches. Uh, winning teams have winning coaches. Uh, Albert Einstein once said, "Do the same thing over and over, and expecting different results is the definition of insanity." And yet we do this every day in business. We think that okay, well we're going to do something, uh, we're going to change something, but yet. Uh, we're going to keep the same structure in place or we're going to keep the same processes in place. And that is, that's insanity. Our old way of thinking, well, in some places it's still the same, uh, is that either a product is good or bad. Um, for those of you that know what a spec limit is, specification limit, uh, we may say that, okay, we can be in the upper spec limit and still be good. Well, we may be. But we also know that it's a person that usually inspects those products. And we're going to have variability in people. Not everybody is, is the same. We all have, there's different aspects to, to, uh, um, to variability. And face it, man, people, our operators, are probably the biggest variable. If I have 10 people, then I'm going to have 10 different uh, variations. So I want to keep the processes as close as possible and as, as, uh, as easily defined as possible so that all that variability remains is as close as we can, as, as we can get. Um, Lean is about eliminating eliminating waste, and Six Sigma is about reducing variation. Now, when you look at this, you see that on the upper spec limit, for instance, if I have 
something that's just a little bit on the um, inside of the upper spec limit, there's a good chance that when I'm looking at a bell curve and I know that statistically not everything is either good or bad, I know I'm going to have a little bit of fallout. So the objective is to reduce our variation and move our the mean of our sample, which we're, you know, when we talk about we're taking a sample of, of data, we move that sample over towards the target, the mean closer to the target, and our and reduce our variation. And if we can do that, we're going to make good parts. Things we look at, we talk about rejects, we talk about rework and inspection, and all these are costs. Well, we don't see, and, and here's the thing, on machine shops, for instance, and smaller uh, operations. I hear, Tom, we're, we're a job shop. We don't have many, uh, you know, we don't, we're not the same as a manufacturing plant. And they're absolutely right. But setups, setting that, that equipment up, to run that next part is probably more important for them than it is on a, on a large manufacturer. To give you an idea on setups, I've been in plants where um, I'll have engineers come up and say, Tom, this is the best we can do. We're, we're at three hours on a setup. And then that's it. They don't, they don't look at improvements anymore. On setups, back in the uh, back in the 50s at Toyota, they had at the time the largest uh, uh, press in the world. And it took over 24 hours to set that press up. By continuously improving their process, they ultimately got that down to 54 seconds. It didn't happen overnight. That took years, but it was continuous improvement. Late deliveries and expediting costs. A lot of times we're paying, as, as the uh, manufacturer, we're still paying for our expediting costs. And then think about it, on late deliveries, on late deliveries, do we, how often are we making the customer upset? And if you, if you give your customer a chance, because most of us have competition, if we give our customer a chance to uh, to go and look for uh, another supplier, they may find them, and we may not like the outcome. So we could lose sales. Silos. The problem I find is a lot too is that we have silos, and we give our our specific um, functional areas. We'll give them metrics, say, for instance, purchasing. I'll come back to purchasing as, uh, as a VP and say, okay, you need to cut price. So they come back and they do their job, they follow their metrics, and they, they cut price. While the cost of the product may go up, their metric is going down. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the quality. The quality of the product may go down, and what happens is is that all of a sudden that product comes in, and the operations team has to rework, and that rework is in a lot of cases charged to the operations team. So what happens is is you hear, well, you know, you're you're spending too much, you have too much indirect labor, and you have to cut your labor down. When in essence, a lot of that is because of the poor quality of, of product we're getting in. So it's not always about cutting price. It's about looking for the for the best cost, and that cost includes uh, your quality, your cost, your delivery, your your safety, um, your transportation cost, everything. Principles of lean, when we're talking about lean, we talk about uh, value from the customer's perspective. And now, this, it, 
touches home at times because a lot of people don't like to hear about hear it. Everybody wants to be value added, and that's true. That while we may even fall under non value added, we may be non value added that's needed. Okay, so what do I mean? Well, value added is does the customer care about it? Um, does it change the product while it's going through the process? And is it done right the first time? And if it meets those three criteria, then it's value added. Now, sure, management. Am I value added? No. I'm non value added, but needed. Okay, great. And then there's non value added that is non needed. Now, we can reduce the non-value added that's needed, but we're trying to eliminate the non-value added that's not needed and adds nothing at all. Okay, so we define our value stream. Then we, we eliminate the unnecessary steps in that value stream. And our goal is to make everything flow. And we pull by the customer customer's demand, and then we're in pursuit of perfection. Now, I was in some of the areas that, I, that I've worked in, because, you know, like, like I say, some people say, hey, this is only for manufacturing. Well, to give me an idea, I've worked with a couple of IT groups, um, a large telecommunication company, um, both large and small manufacturing, federal and state government, construction companies, um, finance, and other service industries. Uh, the bottom line is if, if it involves people and processes, then the Lean Six Sigma tools, operational excellence will help. And we're always looking for perfection. We're never going to meet perfection. We're, we're, we're always trying to pursue it. Waste. Well, we have overproduction. Overproduction um, is probably one of the worst forms. It's uh, we're making we're making more than we need. Now, one waste that's not that I don't have in my presentation that is what I feel one of the one of the biggest wastes is the waste of underutilizing the talent in our workforce. We don't go to the gimba, which is the plant floor, in a lot of cases, and talk to the workers. And the, they are our best engineers. I usually find that by including them, um, we can improve our processes and, and, uh, and make, make a higher quality product for a lower cost. Correction. They are eliminating our errors. And I'm going to go back on that. When, when I say eliminating errors, um, at the end of a lot of processes, I, I'll see at the end of a line 99% first time quality. And then I'll see 100 units sitting off to the side. And I'll ask, okay, so what's going on there? How can we have that many units and still be 99%? Did we make that many units today? And I'll say, no, they don't count yet because they haven't went through the uh, final inspection. Those are to be reworked, and then they go through the final inspection. And what's funny is, is I do this training all the time, and people will, will mention that when I say this, they'll start shaking their heads and say, yeah, yeah, that happens here too. Um, the objective is to look at each part of that process and figure out what's our quality, say, on our first operation, and then what's our quality and rework on the next operation, and then on the next. And we start eliminating those errors in those processes and making it so that uh, quality is built in. It's not a... Uh, you know, I, I believe that quality quality departments should be auditors. Um, I mean, that's a simplistic view, but uh, 
to have them going out and inspect all the time uh, when the operators, it takes the responsibility away from the operator. Okay, inventory. Um, inventory is simple, bringing more in than we need. And what happens here too, think about this, when we, I talked about the silos earlier and, and poor quality. When we start to have poor quality, what do we do? We expedite because we can't shut our lines down because of poor quality. So then we bring in more inventory than we need. And and then all of a sudden, because it's uh, uh, the, the fire of the day, we forget about that inventory because now we're on our next our next emergency. And when we're all of a sudden at the end of the year, we see, okay, we have all this obsolete inventory. And in a lot of people's minds, they think, well, you know, I've paid for it, and I never know when I'm going to use it. So I'll keep it. And that costs you money. And the more inventory you have, the less cash flow you have. Motion, uh, motion is simply, you know, that operator walking around. Um, it can be in offices. Think about when extra steps involved in offices, um, the extra waste going between different uh, uh, departments. On an operator, it can be as simple as walking from grabbing part A to install it and then walking over and grabbing part B. It's eliminating as much of that waste as we can. As we can. Over-processing. Um, a lot of it, it, it adds, it's non-value added to it. it uh, the biggest thing I can say on this is like on our sign-offs or long emails, things that waste our time. How about emails that everybody gets an email and only about three out of a hundred people on that email are really relevant to the email. And then you're getting all the reply alls. And, and that wastes time. We don't think it wastes much time, but at the end of the day, when you see when you have a hundred emails in your box or more, uh, there's uh, it takes time to go through those. And then if you see, you know, you have to read them because you don't you don't know if you've been included in them. Conveyance, uh, conveyance is is uh, moving our materials from uh, all over the place. Our distance traveled. Um, I'll see where forklifts might travel. It's one thing. It, it's not good. It's it's bad when I see forklifts go one direction with nothing on them. But when I see them go in both directions with nothing on them, okay, then there's an issue. Um, you know, the objective is not to uh, have forklifts driving all over or to in, or to involve more forklifts. Usually, what I find is when I go into places, we can. Uh, eliminate the use of a lot of forklifts, um, and to increase by increasing the utilization of each forklift, and then waiting. We hurry up and wait a lot. We uh, you see operators. You see when you um, you know when we turn in reports and stuff. We hurry up get the stuff in, and then we have to. Um, uh, we have to wait or meetings uh, that we we have a certain time and, and uh, somebody shows up late so it starts late. That takes our time. Like I mentioned, Six Sigma is about reducing variation. What are the six M's? Man, method, material, mother nature, measurement, and machine. Now think about this. Once again, man. There are several people on this call today, and everybody got up this morning and did something just a little bit different. And when you go to work, even if we all worked in the same place, we're all going to do something a little bit different. Um, I hear people say, leave your problems at the door. Well, we're all human, and we all may have our own issues. Uh, and, you know, it, it may be problems at home. Uh, it may be, you know, your kid's recital. This is all variation. 
because you can't leave your problems at home. And what we need to do is try to come in and build a method, a process, so that if I am having an issue, I can look at my process and I can know what to do. Now, it's I'm all into pictures. <laughs> I think that we, if we make our processes as simple as possible so that anybody can understand it, then, then there shouldn't be a question. Um, and if everybody's looking at the same process and working on the same process, guess what? If that process changes, which I hope it does, I hope it improves, I hope somebody comes back and says, hey, let's do this instead of this. Great. Then we change the process. Our material. Well, our materials change. Most, most materials have some recipe to them. Now, if one, re if one part of that recipe becomes a little bit more expensive than another part of the recipe, then, they're, then somebody's going to add a little bit more of the non-expensive material and less of the expensive material. Mother Nature can cause havoc, and that's not just Mother Nature from the standpoint of our weather. It can be Mother Nature from the standpoint of uh, an environmental issue, a safety issue. And then measurement. How are we measuring? Do we have a measurement system? Do we have metrics? Are our metrics valid? You know, we may have been collecting data for the last 20 years, and that data means absolutely nothing. Nobody's looked at it. So what are we measuring, and how are we how are we looking at it? And then machines. And we can have. When I say machines, if you're in an office, it can be your computer, it can be your platform, your IT platform. And there's variability in that. And the funny part is, is no matter what, if we're talking IT here, we're talking equipment, it doesn't matter. Nobody ever wants to pay for uh, preventative maintenance. And there's two options. Either you're going to take it down on your time, or it's going to go down on its time. Okay, in Six Sigma, what we do is we take a practical problem, and we turn it into a statistical problem. So we turn it into a data-oriented problem. And then we solve that statistical problem, and we put a control plan in, and then we turn it back into a practical solution. Now, when I talk Six Sigma, and just so everybody knows, I use what's called an A3 report. Um, Toyota developed the A3 report. Um, and to, to give you an example of how um, easy or uh, how Toyota thinks, it's called an A3 because it's on A3 paper. Um, and it tells the background. So it goes through, we can go through a whole domain process. What I find is, is that if I use the traditional Six Sigma project charter, a lot of times that can be too complicated. And by taking the complexity out, I get more projects done. Now, there may be some cases where the project charter might be the better solution. But I try to break these projects down. So for instance, if I have what everybody wants to tackle, they'll say, OK, I want to fix logistics. <laughs> Okay, that's a that's a large project. I'll break that down into small, um, smaller projects that can be quick hit projects, and do kaizens, which are improvements. And that way, I'm showing improvements all the time, instead of at the end of the year looking at it and saying, "Oh, we didn't accomplish our goal of of, uh, of fixing logistics." But at the end of the year, I can say hey, we achieved eight out of 10 of our goals, uh, and here's where we stand right now. We've made a lot of improvements. OK, so procedure, analyze, improve, and control. Um, who, who are the customers, and what, what do they want? Uh, how's the process performing, and how are we measuring it? What are the most important causes of the defects? How do we remove these? these defects, and then probably the most important is how do we control it? Okay, defining 
Well, first, we have to know what the critical to quality is. What's important to our customer? And we have customers both internal and external. Our internal customer may be the next guy in line. Or, yeah, our internal, sorry. Our external is the final user. Okay? And what's the problem? Does it occur on certain in certain conditions? Who's on the team? And then first of all, let's build a high-level process map. And when I build process maps, let's start, let's bring some operators in. So usually what I find is, is I'll bring in my, uh, uh, my leadership team and they'll build what they think it is. Um, and then the next phase is I'll bring in the operators and they'll add everything that really is happening. And and that should be is a lot bigger than what it's supposed to be. And then when everybody gets together and, and all the creative juices are flowing, we build a what it, what it should look like in the end. And that's usually a complex free process. But it's including everybody. On measurement, all of our inputs, so you see the X's on the one side, those are all of our inputs. Then we put it into our process and out comes our outputs. And like I mentioned earlier, we're trying to shift the mean to our target and we're re and we're trying to reduce our variation. On analyze, we're trying to get the uh, figure out what what inputs are causing the biggest output variation. And then on improve, we're trying to fix the process. What is the ideal? And then once again, now here's the thing. We can put on control, we can have somebody sit there and try to control it um, and try to inspect it, but we know that that's a person, right? So why don't we come up with an idea on how to mistake-proof the process? Six Sigma. You know, we think about 99% being good. And you look at some of these examples. 200,000 wrong drug prescriptions a year are 99% good. Uh, 68,000 or 68 in a year is 99.9997. On culture change, you, you know, I hear, well, quality costs money. And it depends on how you're looking at it, how you're doing it. But we've, I've already shown on the, uh, the cost of poor quality, how poor quality can be very expensive. Because we don't look at certain things. We don't look at our rework. We don't look at expediting. We don't look at our waste on our inventory. Um, rework. Well, rework's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of money. What can we, if we did it right the first time and we started to control our processes, then we can, we can make a better product for a lower cost. The objective, like it says, is defects must be prevented. Variability is the, is the enemy. How do we continue to, to try to reduce uh, variation? And then mistake proof as much as possible. Visible management and commitment. You know, I had a uh, COO once that, uh, that was just phenomenal. Now, not all the operators liked him, but he'd go down to the floor every day. He'd walk the floor, and this was a large plant. Um, I think it was almost 800,000 square foot, and he would walk it every day. And like I say, some operators didn't like him because he called them out. But he knew the process, and he knew everything about that plant, and he enforced gimbal walks from, his, from all of his leaders. And he left, and a new COO came in. 
Now, the new COO said that uh, uh, he was on the floor every day, too. Uh, but his idea of the floor and and the other COO's uh, view of the floor are two different things. Walking from the doors to the cafeteria and then back are usually not walking the floor. I mean, technically, I guess it could be. I'd ask operators, do you know who such and such is? They'd say, no, who is that? Well, it's the COO, been here for six months. But I could ask them who the old COO was, and everybody knew who he was. And they told me they missed him. It's visible management commitment. They knew that he would hold them accountable. People want to be hold, held accountable. They want to do a good job. 90% of our workforces truly want to do a good job. People selection, getting the best and the brightest. Surround yourself with good people. Get, make them accountable. Sense of urgency. That's key. You have to have a sense of urgency. Don't just say, well, I can do it tomorrow. What are your customers' requirements? Ask your customer. Find out. What do they need? What do they want? Honesty in your in measuring your current performance. Okay, I mentioned that about 99% where people will say, yeah, we're at 99%. Well, that's not your current, that's not really your current performance. Your current performance might, when you look at each step, heck, you might be under 60%. Now, I, I understand you can't go and measure, you know, start saying 60%, and then you have a customer walk in that doesn't understand what that 60% means. But within your own organization, you have to you have to have you have to be honest. You have to understand where you're hurting, and then fix it. You need to be disciplined. And prioritize those those few projects. Communicate your success stories. Face it, a winning team. Do they celebrate? If they win the championship, they're celebrating. If they win a game, they celebrate. We have to do the same thing. When we win, we celebrate with our team, the people that are actually adding the value, and then reward and recognize the top performance and continue to drive a change in your culture. You'll see where the, where the culture will really start to change. It takes about a year to at least start to change. But you'll see that everybody starts talking the same talk. Everybody understands the same thing. And it's pretty neat when the DNA starts to change. Okay. Um, I know we, we said questions and answers uh, afterwards, or to email them or whatever. Um, Let's see. Is there anything that I may or may not have have a uh, um, you know that anybody may have a question on? Because I do have a couple of minutes here that we can talk about maybe questions. If uh, you want to email those or text or send them in, you know, on the questions portion of this. Lenora, is that is that uh, possible for people to maybe send a question in? Okay. If there are no further questions, you see my contact information. You're more than welcome to send me a note. Um, or call me, and uh, and we can talk. I hope this I hope this answered some questions on Lean Six Sigma and operational excellence. Thank you. 
So thank you very much for attending this webinar. You can check PCB's webinar schedule in our website, www.pcb.org. Thank you very much.